Welcome to Savvy Sab's podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. My special guest today is Professor Mirandi. He is the professor of English literature and Orientalism at the University of Tehran. Thank you so much for joining me, Professor Mirandi. Thank you very much for having me. So I guess the first question that I have for you is obviously in reference to Israel and Gaza. I mean, the the war that's going on in Gaza has been, I would say, trending in international news since October 7th. Uh, but some of us in independent media, we've actually been discussing uh, what has been happening to the Palestinian people uh, prior to October 7th in reference to Israel's occupation of, of Gaza and the people there. I'm really curious to hear what is the sentiment in Iran in reference to this particular conflict and this ongoing battle between Israel and uh, the Palestinian people? I have to go back uh, to the revolution. Uh, before the revolution, uh, the Shah of Iran, who was installed by the CIA and British intelligence, uh, he had very good relations with the Israeli regime, as well as with uh, the, part, the apartheid regime in South Africa. And uh, the, probably the two key foreign policy issues that the revolutionaries were attacking was Iran, the Shah's support for Israel, South Africa. And as soon as the Shah was overthrown. Uh, the, the revolutionary government shut down the South African embassy as well as the Israeli embassy. And uh, in fact, the Israeli embassy, uh, or it's a, it was a, it's not a, it wasn't an officially called an embassy, but it was effectively the regime's embassy in Iran. It is alongside a square, which is now called a Palestine Square. So for the last for decades or so, it's it, that's been the name, and it's in central Tehran. So uh, the revolutionaries began to, or the revolutionary government began to fund both resistance groups in South Africa and also resistance groups in Palestine. Back then, Yasser Arafat was, of course, the head or the leader of the coalition of resistance groups. And so therefore he had priority. And in South Africa, there were different groups, including the ANC and the military wing of the ANC. So Iran began to fund both the ANC, the military wing of the ANC, other groups in South Africa, as well as groups in Palestine. When the apartheid regime in South Africa collapsed, Iran reestablished ties. And one of the first countries that uh, Nelson Mandela traveled to uh, was Iran, to thank the Iranian people for their support. So the position that the Iranians took was that apartheid South Africa is not legitimate for moral reasons, and the Israeli regime is not legitimate for moral reasons, because both are, were supremacist regimes. When apartheid South Africa collapsed, Iran reestablished ties, and now the relationship between Iran and South Africa is quite good. With regards to Palestine, we have a continuation of, of that policy. And so Iran does not recognize the Israeli regime. Iran does not consider it to be legitimate uh, and or morally legitimate. And therefore, Iran has been supporting Palestinian groups uh, and not just Hamas or Islamic Jihad, but a host of different groups, big and small, who've been resisting the regime both through military means, but also those who have, are resisting politically or uh, through nonviolent means. They, all of them have the support of Iran, or at least those that seek support from Iran, they get support. Now, uh, in just to you know end this uh, this part, uh, the the reason why the United States and its allies have antagonized Iran so much over the decades and have tried to undermine Iran uh, through sanctions, through war, 
through terrorism, uh, through um, uh, 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 an array of media outlets that are in Persian and hostile towards Iran. So it's really unprecedented. There's no country in the world that has so many Persian language media outlets beamed in from the West or now online media outlets that are hostile to a country. So there, there's more media outside outside of Iran than there uh, that are news outlets that are actually inside Iran. So it's a huge industry in the West. So through media, through sanctions, through war, through terrorism, the reason why the Americans have been so hostile is not because of a nuclear program or because of human rights or because of terrorism, but because of Iran's position on Palestine. That is very interesting. I think a lot of Americans have misconceptions about Iran. Um, I noticed uh, when I worked in higher ed, uh, when we did have students that applied for a student visa to come to the U.S. Uh, to get their education here, it was very difficult to get them here uh, just because they were from Iran, whereas students from other countries didn't run into that particular issue. Uh, how does Iran feel about this idea of a two-state solution? I, I personally think we're past time for a two-state solution, but does Iran in general support the idea of a Palestinian state, or do they believe that there should be one state? Iran believes that, has, Iran has always believed that there uh, should only be one state, and that it would be an inclusive state where Palestinians, Christians, Muslims, Jews would all have equal rights, and uh, that uh, there cannot be any form of ethno-supremacism uh, anywhere in Palestine. That has always been the Iranian position. But, but Iran has also said that a two-state solution is not even practical, because the Israeli regime has colonized the West Bank with the support of the West. and. The West has been very hypocritical because on the one hand, they speak about the two-state solution, yet on the other hand, they allow the regime to colonize the West Bank, to steal land, to confiscate land, to kill uh, people in the West Bank. It's very important to remember that I think over 400 people now have been murdered by the Israelis in the West Bank since October the 7th. So this has nothing to do with Gaza. And uh, this has nothing to do with October the 7th. Uh, the Israelis are progressively taking more land. They are, they are stealing the resources. They are depriving Palestinians in the West Bank from water. And um, they're building apartheid walls across uh, uh, the, uh, the West Bank. And... The United States and the European Union, they know this. They pretend that they don't see it. And they they speak about a two-state solution to buy time for the Israelis to continue and to ultimately ex, you know, create a, an, uh, an environment where we will have another Gaza, but in the West Bank. That is ultimately what's going to happen. Ultimately, the Israelis are going to do exactly what they did to Gaza, to the West Bank. And therefore, for Iran, it is uh, adamant that the regime must be defeated in Gaza, and that is why Iran is helping them. Uh, I, I will not hide the fact, and I, I'm very proud of the fact that uh, the infrastructure in Gaza, the underground tunnels, the military capability, that all comes from Iran. And uh, right now, after seven months, we see that the Israelis have failed to take any part of Gaza. And uh, if they had succeeded, uh, the uh, Israelis would definitely then later on move on to the West Bank. This is something that was inevitable. Anyone who thinks that the war started on October the 7th is only closing their eyes to reality in order to justify uh, ethnic cleansing and genocide. That is the objective by pretending that this started on October the 7th. But without a doubt, we will have more genocide in the West Bank if they succeed here. And so for the Iranians, uh, a two-state solution is uh, not moral because it would mean that 
the Israeli regime is able to keep their ethno-supremacist regime, let's say, within uh, smaller uh, a smaller piece of territory. They may give up, let's say, 10% or 15%, hypothetically. If they return the whole of the West Bank, which is impossible, uh, they would still have, I think, more than roughly 80% of the land, more than 80% of the land, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, your, your viewers can look that up. It's something around that, probably a bit more. But anyway, um, they would keep that land. And um, that would still be an ethno-supremacist state. So Iran is saying morally, we cannot accept it. However, however, this is an important footnote. If the Palestinians come to an agreement with the Israeli regime, Iran won't impede that agreement, even if it doesn't accept it. However, it must be all-inclusive. In other words, when we speak about the Palestinians, we're speaking about the Palestinians that are in the West Bank. We're speaking about the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. We're speaking about the Palestinians inside what is now called Israel. Uh, and we're speaking about the millions of Palestinians in refugee camps in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and elsewhere. So they have to have a say in whatever happens in future. But Iran's position is a one a one state, uh, a single state where, as I said before, everyone has equal rights. Professor Morandi, uh, what about the other countries in the Middle East? For example, uh, Jordan. The Queen of Jordan is herself Palestinian. Uh, Egypt. Uh, why aren't the other countries? I mean, why aren't they willing to fight for the Palestinian? people do you think it's because of their relationship that they have with the united states government or you feel it's something deeper there are a number of issues really one is that no one is willing to make the sacrifices that iran has made iran the sac has made huge sacrifices over the decades and uh, supporting palestine has come come at a heavy costs uh, the sanctions on Iran, the maximum pressure sanctions, have always been targeting women and children. Obama called them, uh, I think he called them uh, crippling sanctions. So the objective of, of Obama was to cripple Iranian society, to cripple ordinary Iranians. And then Trump called them brutal sanctions. He wanted to brutalize Iranians, but it's the same thing. So. The objective of Obama and Trump was to brutalize ordinary people, to bring Iran to its knees, and to force Iran to become obedient to the United States. Other countries are not willing to make that sort of uh, sacrifice for this principle. And as I said, this principle goes before the revolution. The revolutionaries in Iran, uh, they... You know, all their statements against the, against the Shah and their statements during the revolution and then after the revolution all had these two foreign policy issues at the top of their list. It's it's very well documented. So Iran's this is a principal stand and Iran has paid a heavy price. And what the United States has done and its Western allies is that through sanctions, but also through, as I said, a, a host of media uh channels, well, online media, TV channels, satellite TV channels, they've been trying to demoralize Iranians. They've been trying to create uh, unrest in the country you know, through disinformation and then using terror groups that are based in northern Iraq and Albania. The, the United States has a number of um, troll farms that are for, for Iranians. Uh, thousands of them are in Albania. That's the biggest troll farm that they have. And they work 24 hours a day. So each person has tens of accounts. And sometimes you can tell if you look at some of my tweets, uh, I a tweet I had a couple of days ago, you can see a couple of hundred, uh, you know, accounts attacking me. But you see like uh, the, um, the, the accounts are very similar. The sentences are similar. Uh, the profile pictures, many of them are for some reason Korean. Uh, so I have a lot of people who are cursing me in Persian and, and, and saying that we will rape Palestinian kids in Persian. And uh, uh, but the profile pictures are of Korean pop uh, stars. 
or, or singers. And it's very interesting that those who, for example, support my, what I say in the tweet, uh, you can find it, I can give, send you the tweet later. Those who support me in the tweet, many of them are, you know, hidden. You know, you, those like, those accounts that are hidden. But those who threaten me, who threaten to rape family members, who say they'll they'll rape Palestinians, um, none of them, as far as I could see, and there are a couple, like maybe 100 to 200 of them, uh, none of them are hidden. In other words, there is something, there's a very close relationship between Twitter, the Western intelligence agencies, and these troll farms, where they get a, uh, they get special, special priority, and uh, you can't complain. You cannot send anything to Twitter. Twitter. Twitter will simply say that, you know, they haven't violated any rules, and uh, you have to move on. So the United States has this huge apparatus where you, they use sanctions, they use military bases to threaten Iran, they use terror organizations based in northern Iraq alongside the Pakistani border because uh, the Pakistani government is weak and um, the, the border alongside Iran is not well protected by the government there. And then, of course, as I said, troll farms. And the interesting thing is these troll farms in the West, as it's clear, they're funded by Western governments. And so are all these terror organizations. So all of these together are there to are are combined to put pressure on ordinary Iranians to make them uh, to 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 force them or to 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 uh, to force people to rise up against Iran's government. That's the objective. And uh, despite all that, if you look at the polls that have been carried out by Western uh, uh, organizations, but also Iranian organizations, overwhelmingly Iranians support the Palestinian cause. And I must say that the minority of Western-oriented liberals in Iran that are critical of Iran's foreign policy, uh, many of them are shifting. This, of course, is anecdotal because I haven't seen recent polls since October the 7th. But I have met, spoken to many students, colleagues, relatives, friends who, before we we had to, we used to have uh, discussions about um, Palestine and Israel and and so on. And you can see, at least I I can see through these anecdotal experiences, that even those who in the past had differing views and thought that we should cut down support or that we should, you know, limit our support to um, aid and assistance. Uh, many of them, or at least all of them that I know, um, now believe that is, the Israeli regime is not a regime that we can tolerate in this region. So what Israel has done for the last seven months is that it has hardened the position in Iran towards the regime. I'm not saying it's universal in Iran, because but uh, the support for Palestine is definitely very strong in Iran. But as I said, my anecdotal experience is show that those who thought differently, at least those who I know, they their positions have changed. So as we know, uh, Israel struck the Iranian embassy in Damascus, and of course, Iran responded to Israel, and Israel responded uh, back to Iran. Does Iran want a war with Israel or with the United States? Because at that point, Israel would push the US to get involved in that type of conflict. Does Iran actually want a war, or are they trying to send a strong message to Israel? You ask difficult questions, and I have to give long answers, and I may bore your audience. I'm sure I'm boring your audience, but let me put it this way. Iran has been assisting Hamas and Islamic Jihad and all the other mili uh, militant groups in Palestine for many years. And as I said, these tunnels that have been key to the defeat of the Israeli regime, these weapons, these are basically with Iran. They've been created and developed with Iranian support. And, uh, and uh, of course, without heroic uh, resistance fighters in Hamas and their allies, uh, none of this support could have resulted in any achievement. So, uh, 
Iranian support plus the resilience of the Palestinian people has led to this strategic defeat of the Israeli regime in Gaza. Iran's support for Hamas and others and Hezbollah has different means, but one of the places where they've been carrying out this support was through Syria. And uh, that's why the dirty war began in Syria. Uh, in, you know, in the West, they like to say Assad killed his own people, or gassed his own people. He never gassed his own people. And uh, if you invite Aaron Matei, for example, on one of your shows, he could explain exactly what happened and, uh, and, um, and how the West manufactured these uh, claims in order to bomb Syria and in order to put pressure on Syria. But from the very beginning in Syria, the objective was to help Israel. And they, the West wanted to do this by, uh, through neighboring countries, and those neighboring countries, they thought that they would gain something out of it. They could create a zone of influence inside Syria for themselves if they cooperated with the West in undermining the country. So we have, so for example, we have Jake Sullivan's famous email to Hillary Clinton on February the 12th, 2012, where he said in Syria, Al Qaeda is on our side. But this was very early on in the dirty war when he wrote this email. And of course that means that since 2011, they were working together. It, it, what did it, it if it's February the 12th, 2012, then it doesn't mean that on February the 11th, Al-Qaeda and the United States were working together. Or later on, we have a leaked uh, audio of Kerry, who was the subsequent Secretary of State, when he was speaking at the UN in a private session with the so-called Syrian opposition, in other words, the American-funded uh, American funded Syrians. He said in that audio, and th this is online, both of these are online, uh, the email was leaked by WikiLeaks, uh, and obviously that's why one reason why Julian Assange should be in solitary confinement. But um, Kerry said in that audio that the United States allowed ISIS to advance on Damascus to put pressure on the Syrian government. And of course, we have another document. I, there are many documents. Uh, the Israeli role and how they supported ISIS and Al-Qaeda in Syria. That's very well documented. But also another document that I think is useful is that the US Defense Intelligence Agency had a report, 2012, which was published later, where it said that US allies in the middle, the so-called Middle East, or what we call West Asia, that they wanted to create a Salafist entity between Syria and Iraq. And of course, between Syria and Iraq, it was ISIS that created this state. So US allies in the region wanted to create ISIS between Syria and Iraq to sort of to, uh, to surround Syria because in the North, Turkey was supporting ISIS and Al Qaeda and other extremist groups. In the South, it was Jordan. Of course, uh, the United, the, the, the West had uh, a, uh, command center, both in Istanbul and, and, and in uh, Amman. And then they wanted to surround it by blocking Iraq at the route to, to Iraq. And so they created this Salafist state. Later on, the head of the US Defense Intelligence Agency at that time, the very famous Michael Flynn, did an interview on Al Jazeera, of all places, and admitted that the United States supported that policy under Obama. He, he said, he's, he implied that he was not supportive of that policy, but I personally don't believe that. I think that at that time he probably did, and later on it was beneficial to take a different position. Otherwise he could have resigned because it was a very important step that the United States was taking to help create ISIS between Syria and Iraq. So the United States wanted to destroy Syria uh, for the sake of Israel, to, to break Syria. And they they created this that they brought about this dirty war. So Iran began to in 2013, well after all this, the United States, Iran brought in troops to prevent the fall of Damascus to help the Syrian army. Iran, Hezbollah, and others came in to, to block these uh, groups that were 
wanted to raise the black flag in Damascus. And Israel would bomb Iranians from 2013. So the Israelis were supporting ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Whenever the Iranians and the Syrian Arab army or the Syrian army were making progress, especially near the Golan Heights, which belongs to Syria, by the way, uh, the Israelis would bomb them or they would shell them and they would treat uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda injured terrorists and they would give them ammunition. They would support them with um, um, helicopter fire. They would support them with, um, by providing them with ammunition and weapons. But Iran never responded because Iran didn't want the scope of the fighting to expand. They wanted to help you know, end the dirty war in Syria. And of course, in 2015, the Russian Iran um, was able to convince the Russians to come in and the Russians basically provided air cover. And one of the first things that the Russians did was that they began to bomb the oil trade between ISIS and Turkey and ISIS and Northern Iraq, which was known, it was supported by the West. US planes would buy fly overhead and you'd have these tens of thousands of tankers going back and forth, taking oil from ISIS territory to, to Turkey. And the reason why they allowed it was because the Americans and, want, and these countries wanted to strengthen ISIS to so that they could attack Syria and, and defeat the government. So the Russians began bombing that. So the, the point I'm trying to make is that the, for the Americans, Syria was always, and the Israelis, it was always important to, to weaken it because it was through Syria that Iran was helping Lebanon. And it was through Syria, partially, that Iran was supporting Hamas and its allies. Now, uh, and of course, I also have to add a footnote, and I'm, I'm very sorry for you know rambling, but um, we have to remember, because the West likes to pretend that Hezbollah is a some sort of terror organization. Hezbollah came into existence when the Israeli regime invaded Lebanon. They invaded Lebanon and took the capital, Beirut. And it was during that occupation that Hezbollah was born and the resistance began. And Hezbollah began to put pressure on the Israeli regime and they forced them to retreat. And ultimately the Israeli regime was expelled from Lebanon in, 2000, in the year 2000. So Hezbollah is a national resistance uh, group, organization. It is a part of the government right now. It has members of parliament. It has members in the cabinet of Lebanon. But most importantly, it was Hezbollah that kicked Israel out of Lebanon. If it wasn't for Hezbollah, right now, half of Lebanon was, would probably belong to Israel right now, the Israeli regime, because that's how they function. They occupy and they, just like the Golan Heights, just like the West Bank, just like Gaza and elsewhere, and, uh, and Israel itself the, within the 1967 border. So Iran's support for Hezbollah was to help then kick the Israelis out of Lebanon. Iran's support for Hamas and uh, the other groups was because Iran believed them to be like the ANC, like the militant wing of the ANC, uh, liberation movements, like uh, any resistance movement supporting uh, an occupied nation or a, or a subjugated people. So after October the 7th, so that was during the dirty war in Syria. After October the 7th, and the dirty war, by the way, is still going on. In the north of Syria, we still have Al-Qaeda in, uh, in areas that are supported by Turkey and NATO. And to the southeast of the country, uh, the United States has, has occupied, uh, occupied an area called Al-Tanaf. In that area, you have ISIS as well. So they go, they leave that area that's controlled by the Americans, attack Syrian soldiers, kill them, and then go back into those areas that are controlled by the Americans. Uh, effectively, the Americans have occupied one third of Syria. Uh, and the oil that ISIS used to export, now the Americans export, the Americans and their local lackeys. So, but, so, but still the dirty war in Syria is sort of died down. It's not over, but it's died down. Since October the 7th, obviously the Israelis began to target uh, Iranians for this because Iran was supporting the resistance. And uh, they would they killed a number of Iranian officers, and uh, they murdered them in different attacks. Mm. And the Iranians never directly responded. 
But when the regime bombed the Iranian embassy, the Iranians decided that they will have to retaliate. Because if they don't, if they didn't, then tomorrow they could bomb the embassy in Beirut, or they could bomb another building that belonged to the embassy in Damascus, and they could do anything they want. There are no more red lines. So Iran said that uh, first we'll go through the diplomatic uh, channels, and they went to the UN and complained. And the United States, Britain, and France prevented the UN Security Council from condemning Israel, let alone punishing them. This is amazing. For the first time in history, an embassy has been bombed intentionally. Because we know about what happened in Yugoslavia, the Chinese embassy, but the Americans claim that it was a mistake, whatever. But in this case, they fired six uh, missiles into the embassy through with F-35s. And these countries prevented Israel from being condemned. So in, effectively, they were supporting the bombing of the Iranian embassy. So the Iranians had no option but to retaliate. And the Iranians ultimately did. But also, another thing that the Iranians did was that they said that from now on, our policy has changed. If the Israelis attack Iranians or Iranian assets anywhere, from now on, we're going to hit back. And that is going to have a big impact on the regime because their room for maneuver now has lessened when it comes to Iran. Because Iran says, we're going to hit back from now on. So in a sense, the, the Israelis have made a major miscalculation because they've allowed Iran to change policy and the international community supports Iran. Because the United States, Britain and France, are not really, they're not the international community. They're just an isolated minority. The global South, they all support Iran's position. And so Iran was able to strike Israel and the world supported it. Forget, again, forget the West and the Western media. They're no longer as important as they think they are. Ne neither is Western media as important as they think uh, it is, nor are Western governments. So now the, when Iran struck, and I could explain this later on if you want, but when Iran struck, the West, the West tried to pretend that it was a failure and all that, which is nonsense. And I, if you want, I could explain later. But uh, one reason, just one reason is enough to prove that this is not the case. And that is the Americans put a lot of pressure on the Israelis. And the Israelis ultimately, alongside the Americans, refrained from striking back in any meaningful way. And that is because the Iranians warned the Americans that if the Israelis hit us again, we will not hit them with 300 drones and missiles. We're going to hit them with 1,700 to 800 drones and missiles and not our older drones and missiles. We're going to use our really you know, advanced, we're going to hit them very hard with what we have. And the Americans know that if there is a serious exchange between Iran and Israel, Israel will be on the losing end. So that's why they didn't want the, this to expand. But finally, to answer your question, Iran does not want a regional war because it would be catastrophic for the world. Right. The, the West would lose. The United States would lose. And again, we could I could explain that later. But everyone would lose. And it would destroy the global economy because all the oil and gas, well, m much of the oil and gas of the world comes from the Persian Gulf, and from our region, uh, the Caucasus, and uh, if there was war, all that would end, and we would have a situation that would be much worse, in my opinion, than 1929 and the 1930s, the Great Depression, as it, as it is called. Wow. Are, are people in, in Iran, are they aware of all the protests, all the college uh, kids on campus protesting in the United States and how big of a deal this is uh, here in the U.S.? Are they aware of this? Are they able to see that information? Well, this is a very interesting point, and uh, I'm really glad you raised this because I think your audience should know this. Of course, the Iranian uh, government and state television is going to show this these the scenes in, in in New York and Columbia University, UCLA, and all that, and and websites in Iran and media outlets uh, from different political parties are showing this. The more pro-Western uh, media outlets in Iran 
are more mild and the more let's say revolutionary or the more critic hostile to the west or critical of the west are going to be you know show this more you know repeatedly but the persian media that's in the west and western taxpayers are paying for these tv channels and online outlets and telegram channels and 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 so on and and uh, troll farms and robots and all that but the persian media in the west is defending the crackdown so they are saying uh that yes these these rioters some uh they are being uh, they're giving out you know they're rioters and they're giving out free food to people and why are they you know where is this money coming from and and so the Persian media that's being bimmed in mostly from London and Washington, but also in Paris and uh, from from Germany and, and elsewhere. Uh, and it's a huge industry, as I said, they are defending the crackdown and they're saying that these students are a menace and that they are disrupting uh, school uh, university life and they're disrupting students who want to study and uh, and all that. So it is very interesting that uh, the Persian media that's being, but it's it's but also it's people are are laughing at them, and because people see that if they're they know that if there there are protests in Iran, if there are riots in Iran, and these media outlets have would call for violence, and this is another really interesting point. These media outlets that are based in London and the United States, they their their guests would come on shows and say, "Kill the police." beat the police you know uh, this is uh, the right the moral thing to do i tweeted a lot a lot of these during the riots a year and a half ago so your viewers if they want to if they go back to those that period they can just check my tweets i would show how violent the they were not like the protests in the united states they were very violent uh between 70 to 80 or 60 to 70 police officers or officers of the law were killed and these media outlets were encouraging violence, but none of them were, have been shut down. If if one of them was saying this for an English audience, they would be arrested. Okay. The British police would, would shut them down and take them to jail. But when it comes to Iran, they were encouraging violence. They were encouraging attacking police. They were encouraging kill, the killing of police. But the, the, what makes people laugh now is that the same people who are not just supporting protests, but they were supporting riots and they were supporting violence and they were supporting, you know, the killing of of, of human beings. Now, when it comes to the United States, these same people are saying, "Oh, these students, they are they are a menace and they're uh, this is against democratic values and and all that." And you know, it's this was just a year and a half, two years ago. People's memories are not that short. So when they look, when these people are talking on these Persian television channels beaming in from abroad, they're making fools of themselves, basically. Very interesting. Uh, one more piece for you, uh, Professor Morandi. Um, some Americans, uh, particularly, there have been protests also here in the United States in reference to or against the Iran regime. Um, this is in reference to uh, the hijab law. And I, I want to get your opinion about this. I've seen different uh, different information about this. I've looked up this information and obviously read that there is a hijab law, but I've also seen that it's not really enforced. There was a woman uh, actually that was, uh, I'm sure you know about this, that was uh, beaten in Iran for not wearing a hijab. So there were protests here in DC uh, in reference to that particular incident. What is your what is your opinion about this? There are some Iranian Americans that are actually calling for regime change. I don't agree with regime changes, but they're they're calling for that because of what has happened to this individual uh, woman here, and then also just in reference to the law in in general. What is your opinion about this? Well, there again, you're you're asking questions which force me to speak, give long answers, and then your uh, your viewers say this guy, you know, he thinks this is a university class and he won't, you know, he won't, he won't stop. So <laughs> I again I apologize. First of all, there are two things. One is that 
Um, I, w- I would correct, well, my in my opinion, I wouldn't use regime for Iran because that is a term that in the West they use in order to say that our antagonists are all sort of um, illegitimate. And when they you when they make a Western audience you you know when they use this they're they're basically justifying their actions. So if Iran is less legitimate, it's sort of like it's like it's like some people are less human. You can hmm. if you kill Gazans, it's not like if you're killing Germans. If you kill you know Iranians, it's not like you're killing. Uh, I remember if you if you recall during at the beginning of Ukraine, there were a number of uh, journalists who were saying. You know, this is Europe. They're killing. You know, these are like they look like us. In other words, they're white people, and who are being killed. So somehow it's different than if it's you know people who are, you know, like me or you. And so when they use regime, it is really the same thing. They, they don't say the U.S. regime or the British regime. And whenever I'm on a Western media outlet and they say regime, I immediately start saying, well, the American regime does this, and the British regime does that. Does that is sort of my you know response to that narrative, but so I'll I'll I'll, I'll respond to this in, at two levels. One is that Iran has a different culture than in the West, and it is more religious. It's more uh, it it's different. So for example, and in Iran, the the uh, the indecent exposure laws in Iran are very different from the West. So men dress in in Iran usually dress you know they don't dress in shorts or like uh, they, they wear a shirt on the streets uh some the, the sort of things that men and women the way they dress in the United States that's not how they dress here in private you know they may have parties and they they do whatever they want some people drink some people I don't know they you you have gay people in Iran but in their private sphere and but in public, People are support, supposed to obey the, the law, which is based on Iranian religion, the religion in Iran, the predominant religion and tradition. So women are more conservatively uh, clothed. And most, according to polls, a, a strong majority of women support hijab. Now, you may say, or many may say, uh, that we don't, well, people should have their own um right to choose. That's debatable. And in Iran, we have that debate. Iran is not a closed society. We have that debate in class. We have the debate in uh, family gatherings. We have that, you know, those discussions. We have all sorts of discussions in Iran, unlike what people in the West seem to think. Uh, if you just get, if you just get in a taxi and drive around or get the metro, use the metro or get on a bus, you'll see that people in Iran will or they'll talk about every any, everything and anything. So it's very different from the sort of stereotype that I think exists in the West about Iran. Now, regardless of the whether the law is a good law or the bad law, there is a there is a reason behind the law. It's not because the men in Iran want to crush Iranian women and Iranian women should be, I don't know, in a closet or something and you know, and they beat them and then they cook for them and they beat them again and they put them back in the closet. And then, no, that's not Iranian society. In fact, I would argue that the West advocates uh, crushing women because the West supported the extremist groups in Afghanistan to fight the Soviet Union. They brought this culture, which today in Afghanistan, women can't go to school. So the Americans brought this about ISIS, Al Qaeda that we saw in Syria and Iraq. They're uh, they uh, enforce huge limitations on women. So I always say that that Islam is not, that is American Islam. That's NATO Islam. That's CIA Islam. That the Americans with their local allies, like the Saudis, with you know, through Wahhabism and Salafism, they promoted these ideologies. So they attack Iran, but they promote, they've been promoting terror groups and, and countries that have actually done this sort of thing. In Iran, and again, I'm sort of rambling, but in Iran, uh, my boss is a woman. Uh, I've, I've, I've said this before a number of times. I've been, at the, I've been a professor at the University of Tehran for 20 years. In my faculty, uh, the dean of my faculty for, the, for 17 of those 20 years uh, ha- has been a woman. 
two different women, but for the last 17, 20 years, 17 of those years, the dean of my faculty at the University of Tehran, the most well-known university, I'm not saying it's the best university, but the most well-known university in the country has been a woman. The last person that we've hired in my department is a woman. Uh, she used to be a student at our university. She's a top-notch academic, better than me. Uh, she's she's uh, the latest uh, addition to our staff, right? I'm also an affiliate in another department in another faculty. Uh, and uh, in that department, the last two people who we hired, or not, we, well, yes, we as collectively hired, were women. So in the two departments that I'm involved in at the University of Tehran, the last three people to become academics over the past few years were women. So my boss is a woman. And also there was a time during this period, a number of years, that my department was run by a woman. So my boss was a woman. My boss's boss was a woman. We have women pilots. We have women truck drivers. We have women taxi drivers. We have women scientists, we have women professors, we have, so it's, I'm not saying Iran is a utopia, by the way, but this is, uh, you know, very different from what the West said. But the logic behind the hijab law is because they, whether in the West they agree with this or not, or elsewhere, some Iranians or many Iranians or whoever agree with this or not, is that they are saying, they say that uh, in the West, women are commodified, they are sexualized, uh, they're objectified, and this is to prevent that from happening. Now, you can debate and say, well, this is not the way to do it. Someone may say, yes, this is the right thing to do. This is our religion, this is our culture, whatever. It doesn't matter. But the point that I'm making is that this is not, you know, there is a logic behind it. Just like you may support a law about um, what? Uh, abortion, and someone may be against this law, and both sides have their own logic. It's not as if one side is just, you know, necessarily uh, holding a, a, a like in at UCLA a baseball bat, and the other side is trying to talk reason. There is a logic. The, Iran is not an irrational, dangerous place. So. Uh, the hijab law, there is a logic behind it, whatever, you know, people, different people think about it. The point that I'm trying to make is that this is not some you know, crazy society. Then it came, we go back to what happened to that young lady, Mahsa Amini, a year and a half ago. As soon as she she was taken in to custody for, for her dress, rightly or wrongly, and she wasn't arrested. She was taken to this place where they talked to her and they say, you know, you know, young lady dressed better, and what she's she's not she wasn't wearing handcuffs. She for for you know medical reasons that she had in the past, she collapsed there and she passed away. The footage that was that exists back from back then does not show her being beat. It does not show her showing signs of being beat. She got out of this van. She went into the. She sat there for a couple, uh, an hour, I don't know how long, and she was talking to someone and she suddenly collapsed. And then they took her to the hospital. Her father, there's footage of this, went to her bedside after she died. He saw, he said, there are no, you know, there are no signs of uh, beatings on my daughter. They, they were saying, look, you know, touch her, feel her, look at her head. And he said there that she had an operation on her brain when she was, I don't remember now, this is like two years, almost two years ago. But, um, um, and she was taking medicine and whatever. And uh, we're going back a long time. Uh, so, uh, but there's also something else that I don't remember. Uh, I know I, there's something in there that I can't find in my brain, but I'll see if I remember it later on. But the these per, the Persian language media funded by the West immediately began to say that um, she was she was tortured, she was beaten, she was in prison. And then they said, I think they even said she was in prison for three days, whereas this was just like one hour. And that, and the police in Iran 
they were slow. They, the footage came out like two, three days later. And by that time, they'd already created this huge narrative that they were beat, they battered this girl and they, you know, uh, and so on. But the evidence never showed that. The evidence never showed she was not handcuffed. She was not like holding her head when she got out of the van. She was not showing any signs of physical trauma. She was sitting in a hall with others. She stood up. So, and then the autopsy also, and there were top doctors involved in the autopsy because it was a sensitive issue. And the, the doctor said that, you know, she died because of uh, her, you know, because of her, uh, it was linked to the operation that she had on her brain and she didn't take the medicine or couldn't take the medicine. I, I don't remember the story, but in any case, I, I don't want to say anything that's imprecise. Um, because it would, you know, it's not right. It's a, it's a, it's a long time ago. So, and I'm growing old, so I have to be careful. But in, the point I'm saying is that whether they, what they took her in was the right thing or the wrong thing to do. Um, I don't, I don't think it was the right thing to do, but let's say it was. They did not, there's no sign that she was tortured, but they created an environment through a massive media campaign that this girl was battered and beaten come to the streets, protest, and then they started saying, beat the, the beat the police. They were training people through Twitter, through Facebook, through Instagram, through through other media outlets, through uh, telegram channels, how to burn down buildings, how to attack cops, how to make weapons. All of this was being done in Western countries. All of this was being done in Western countries. They wanted violence because they wanted to undermine Iran. So they sanctioned Iran, tried to make people, the, the lives of ordinary people difficult. Then they used misinformation or more appropriately disinformation to you know, create division in, in the country. And uh, so that's that. And again, just a few days ago, the BBC, and I don't know how much time we have left, but the BBC tried to revive this. So there was this other girl who, uh, and I, this is the tweet that I was talking about yesterday where I got all these, you know, they're going to rape so-and-so and they're going to murder so-and-so and they're going to rape Palestinians. I, you know, I, early on in our discussion, I referred to that. If your audience goes back and looks at, and look at that tweet, they can translate some of them, although some of them are in slang and they can't be translated. But if they go and look and have them translate, they can see what they, some of these people were saying in Persian. So uh, the BBC published, BBC World, published a document, a secret document in Iran that, you know, that shows a disturbing document that shows that this other girl was, uh, was uh, raped or at least um, molested and then killed. And what the interesting thing was that anyone who knows Persian can see that that document was forged. Uh, there is no, there is no date on the document. There is no uh, number for the document. There, there are all sorts of inconsistencies. And in the BBC World Report, down at the bottom, they say yes, there are many, there are many inconsistencies in this letter. It's not even written in a way which would be normal for a, a, a police report or, or, and then the BB says that we contacted a senior uh, Iranian revolutionary guard and he acknowledged that this was true as if they could access like, it's like uh, an Iranian reporter says, well, yes, we contacted the deputy head of the CIA and he told us, yes, it's true. This document is authentic. Uh, you know, it's uh, impossible to believe that a senior Iranian intelligence officer would do that. So the whole thing was basically, and then what they did, and this is the most immoral thing of all, um, they named people in this forged document, in this document that's clearly forged. And the, people can look on Iranian websites. There are like 40 inconsistencies. And as I said, even the BBC admits that the document is full of inconsistencies. So in this forged document, they name people. So it's sort of like saying you and me are named in a document that we beat up a woman and we killed her. So imagine what, how dangerous it becomes for you and me. So the BBC, and they put this on their website, the BBC World Service, 
for I think I was told for 12 hours it was a top news item in the BBC. This, you know, this document. Why? It's a distraction away from Gaza, in my opinion. It's a distraction away from what's going on. But it didn't work because it came right before the crackdown on um, on the people in, uh, in on students in, in, in the U.S. But I think the reason why the BBC World went with this first and not BBC Persian is because any if anyone sees the document and they've worked in the government bu government bureaucracy, they would know that there's something wrong. And then BBC Persian later on, because it was clear that this was there's something there's a lot of you know things wrong with this document. They said we we rewrote the document to protect our sources. It doesn't make sense if it's a document rewriting it so like let's say they remove the date and i said oh where does this come from it is it is a document if i'm the guy who if i'm a person who knows who has access to the document it doesn't matter if you remove the date or not i know what document you're referring to i don't know if you get the point that i'm trying to make here if there's no number on the document you don't hide anything from the people who have access to the document, it's not as if they say, oh, where did this document come from? Well, it's obvious where it came from. The only, the, when you want to hide your sources, you you hide how you got the document. In fact, the BBC, when it says we spoke to a senior intelligence officer in Iran who had access to this sort of thing, you're in fact revealing your sources because how many people in Iran would have access to such a, a document? So they're lying through their teeth. But the most immoral thing, well, there's a lot of immoral things because they're trying to create this, you know, th this whole notion about the Iranian police raping girls and so on is, is just like Gaza. The fake stories about rape. It's always these, you know, these Muslims, these Arabs, hypersexualized, they're abnormal. You know, this Orientalism that we've had for centuries, you know, no, not, in fact, that's what you had in Abu Ghraib. That's what, you know, you guys you know, these people do, not you. <laughs> That's what these people do. So, but in any case, the, the it's, you know, it's a, it's an Orientalist stereotype that they use repeatedly and it works because it's it, it goes back to that reservoir of Orientalist knowledge. So when they say, oh, the, you know, this Arab raped a woman, it goes back to all those, move, you know, Hollywood movies and goes back to all those novels and hundreds of years of history of, of stereotypes of these people, and it's believable. It's more easily believed by people. And you know, the same is true about African Americans and, and yeah. all, you know, and different people. So we don't have to go down that that road. But um, but they name people, and so these people, if it, you know, these people are effectively threatened under threat because of a forged document. But in any case, as I said earlier, Iran is no utopia and it's no dystopia. It's a normal country if people travel almost universally in my experience, but I would say almost universally. When people come to Iran, they are shocked at, at, from the West because they see how different Iran is from what they thought it would be. And people who come to Iran love, usually love Iran. And uh, it is not what they say. And I think that people, if they travel to Iran, they would understand that for themselves. It is a, uh, we don't support genocide anywhere. Uh, we don't um, uh, overthrow governments. Uh, and and uh, I think that, you know, Western governments and Western media that support genocide, that support uh, mass murder, whether it's in Gaza or in Yemen, they supported the genocide there or in in Libya, the destruction of Libya, or the plundering of resources in Africa and Latin America, or the war in Iraq, and so on. I don't think they're in any position to talk about human rights in Iraq. All right, Professor Mirandi, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for having me.